as we do. So this morning, uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be continuing through the Gospel of Mark together. And I got a chance to listen to uh, the message, you know, Rick shared last week. And I enjoyed that. Thank you, Rick. And last week, you know, Rick, he taught through, and if you want to turn your Bibles, Mark chapter 12 is where we'll be today. <coughs> Rick finished out the chapter, Mark chapter 11, with Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem, as we learned and read, for the second time and the final time. And you'll remember uh, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, they came to Jesus and they, with this question about the authority of his actions. And if you look a little bit into the passage, it seems to be a formal public response uh, of these leaders trying to deal with the disruption that Jesus was causing to their whole religious program and establishment in both Jerusalem, because that was the religious center, but also in Israel at large. And he was a definite threat which we've seen all the way through the gospel, to their man-made institutions, to their traditions. And they were seeking any justification they could to try to publicly discredit and eliminate Jesus. And what better way in this hugely public time of the Passover, if they could out him during the Passover, it'd be a huge victory for them. And so in Mark eleven twenty-eight, they say to him, Right, They kind of come to him publicly as this consensus, this united front. They all gang up and they come to him. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? So they ask these two questions. What things were they referring to? All the recent events of Mark 11. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. You remember to the shouts of, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. And they made such a ruckus that all, so the Bible says all Jerusalem was moved. They're like, what's going on? And then the cursing of the fig tree by Jesus for failing to bear fruit. And then last of all, the cleansing of the temple by Jesus. Why? Because they had turned his father's house, which was intended to be a house of prayer, for all nations into nothing more than a den of thieves and with the money changers and those who sold the doves like Rick had taught what were they doing? Ripping off God's people who came to worship the worship, worship was required it was required to come and when you came you were guaranteed to get ripped off, they would find a way to disqualify your offering and sell you one you know, at an extreme inflated price. And so, in response to their challenge, so this is a public challenge. So Jesus, he answers them, I'll ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. You want to know what authority I do this by? You answer me, and I'll tell you. And so Jesus, he effortlessly, he turns this intended trap of the rel religious leaders. That's what they always did with the questions. Every question was crafted to try to divide his support and to try to pit him against one view or another. They were always not, they weren't innocent, honest questions, you know, most of the time. And so he, it's effortless. He turns it right right back on them. You want to try an exercise in futility? Try to trap Jesus. You want to waste your time? Try to figure out a scenario that he can't get out of. No, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. And he basically tells them, if you will admit where John the Baptist received the authority from, for his ministry from, you'll have answered your own question about where do I get my authority from, where, you know, for my ministry, because they're one and the same. John was the forerunner to the Messiah who received his ministry from God the Father, and I am Jesus' Messiah. 
Israel's true king sent from heaven. So if you answer this correctly, you'll know he was my forerunner. If you say he came from heaven, you'll know I came from heaven. And now they realize, uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have messed with Jesus uh, publicly because he has them trapped. They were trying to trap him. Now he has them trapped. And what do they do? They refuse to give an honest answer. And they reason among themselves, right, saying, hey, if we say from heaven, they'll say, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you bear fruits of repentance? If we say, well, John came from men. They, they feared the people, for everyone counted John to have been a prophet in need. And so they decide, okay, guys, our best strategy is just play dumb. Just say, who knows, right? And so Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what, what authority I do these things. Basically, you guys aren't being honest. And so I don't, I don't feel any compulsion to have to answer your, you know, try to validate my ministry based on your dishonest question. I don't, I'm just going to go ahead and blow you off, too. And that brings us to our passage today that kind of tying back into where we've been the past couple weeks and with Rick's message. So today, Mark 12, we come to the parable of the vineyard owner. And through this parable, Jesus, <clears throat> in thinking about John the Baptist, he's about to lay the axe to the root. Do you remember when John the Baptist said, you know, the axe is being laid to the root, therefore better bear fruits of repentance. You know, you're going to be cut down if you don't repent. You'll be thrown in the fire. And so, just as Stephen did in his final address to the Jewish High Council in Acts chapter 7, in effect, he was saying the very same thing to these religious leaders that, that Stephen said to the High Council moments before he was martyred. You'll remember Acts chapter 7. This is what Stephen said publicly when he was on trial before the Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of our prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels, but you haven't kept it. And so in this parable, Jesus is about to plainly tell them, don't think you're something special. You know why? Israel has a long history of rejecting and refusing to acknowledge and to obey the authority of those sent by God to them to try to counsel and try to correct and try to guide them away from idolatry and sin. Remember how many brothers did God send to his people to try to get them back on course, right? Guys, turn away from idolatry and sin. Doom will come. It's impending if you don't. And he wanted to, all, all those messengers tried to guide them towards repentance and becoming a fruitful vineyard that blesses God and others. You were given everything you needed to become that blessing. That's what he's going to tell them in this parable. Them, and he's talking about all of Israel. They were supposed to be a fruitful fig tree. They were supposed to be a house of blessing or a house of prayer for all nations. And so you are without excuse. And so I, I titled my message, Without Excuse. Mark 12, 1 through 2, or 12, without excuse. As Paul wrote in Romans 9, you want to see the removal of why they have no excuse? This, plus he's going to talk about it in the parable. But this, you know, Paul said, to Israel had been given all of these things, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service uh, of God, and the promises. To Israel belong the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, 
the eternally blessed God. But instead of becoming a blessing to all nations, you know what they had become? Unfaithful stewards of the manifold grace of God, selfishly hoarding it to themselves, like as if all this was for their own consumption, refusing to become what God intended them to be. And Jesus in his parable is going to tell them, you know, this generation would be the one to give an account for the culmination of their entire history of rebellion to God and his plan. You know, and I was thinking about that, and I thought, does that sound a little dramatic, <clears throat> a little extreme, that this one generation that he's talking to would bear the sins for the whole of his, his whole history of Israel's unfaithfulness and disobedience to God. Like, man, that seems a little dramatic. Maybe if I had thought it, or if I had said it, it might be except for two things. First, what do you think the punishment ought to be for crucifying the Lord of glory? That's what the Bible says they did. They put to death the Lord of glory. Do you think that ought to have a severe punishment attached to it? To fit that crime? That's a once in eternity crime. <laughs> that that happened. Okay? Secondly, not long after the preaching of this parable against you know, these religious rulers of the Jews... Jesus explicitly said so himself. He explicitly said this generation would bear all of those sins when he condemned the Pharisees in Matthew 23. He pronounces woe upon woe upon woe. Woe to you Pharisees for this. You think these parables are bad? When he gets to that, it's not a parable. It's just a scathing condemnation. It's not even thinly veiled. It's just, woe to you for this, and this, and this, and this, and he just lays it out. It's quite a, quite a passage to read through. Let me just read to you what he said about them bearing all those sins. <clears throat> woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. But you know what you are inside? You're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, and here it is, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous. And this is what you say. This is what you think. If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. And therefore, your witnesses against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? And therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues. Imagine that church service. <coughs> Synagogue with their church service. Well, that would be a great one to be out scourging the wise men, the scribes, and the prophets, right? And persecute from city to city that on you, your generation, may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of, and he goes all the way back, he goes back before the law, before the creation of Israel, from righteous Abel. He goes all the way to the beginning to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon who? This generation. 
And then he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, because he's standing there and he's looking over Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till I say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Interesting to note, in Matthew 23, this is already past the triumphal entry where they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he's saying that, you know, you will not see me anymore until this future time. There's going to be a future coming when you will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But this is to be a future event. Right now, this whole generation is under condemnation. And so, <clears throat> if you're in Mark 12 with me, let's start in verse 1. And we'll all read through it. Then he, that is Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers. In some of your translations will probably say tenant farmers. And that's a good idea for us to understand. Vine dressers might be a little bit antiquated, hard to understand. Tenant farmers, okay? So it means it wasn't their farm. <coughs> they worked it for someone else. Okay, and he leased it to the vine dressers. They went into a far country. <clears throat> now, at vintage time, the landowner, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. <clears throat> Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some, killing some. And therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, Don't respect my son. <laughs> but those vine dressers said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will um, the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew they had he had spoken the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Well, what a direct pointed parable, right? This is, not a, this is not one of those kind of vague, I wonder what he's saying. There's birds and fields and trees and seeds and who's who. This is very pointed. It's very intense parable that he draws them in with. In telling this parable, Jesus is drawing from what would have been a very familiar framework for the Jews. Do you know where he's drawing this parable from? He doesn't just pull it out of thin air, although he could have. But he's referring back to Isaiah 5. Let me read you the beginning of Isaiah 5. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Listen to how similar the sounds in the beginning of the construct. He dug it up and cleared it out of its stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst, and also he made a wine press in it. And so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. In Isaiah 5, and in the parable of Jesus, of, of the landowner, who is the one who dug up and planted the vineyard? Say it again, Lord. The Lord. The Lord, right? 
It was his idea. He established it and gave everything necessary to be fruitful and productive. He, he cleared the stones. They didn't do it. He, he cleared the stones. He's like, I'll make this some good land for planting, right? Real easy. He placed a hedge around it for protection. He dug a wine vat to receive wine from the harvest. He built a tower in it so it could be guarded and protected, right? And he planted it with not just any vine or garden variety vine or discount vine, but the choicest vine. Like he gave everything the best. He prepared the land. He protected it. He guarded it. He planted the best in it. And then he leases it to the vine dressers, to the tenant farmers, and he goes to a far country. And so, whose idea was the vineyard? God's. Was it the tenant farmer's idea? No. God already had it going on before they ever were, you know, showed up or asked to come to the table. Who established it and provided everything needed to expect a good harvest? God. And then he enters into a contract with the tenant farmers. And, and it, the expectation is that he comes back at vintage time and he would receive some fruit. Pretty simple. Like, hey, I set everything up. You run it. I'll come back. You take the cut. I get mine. <coughs> like, this is a simple business. It makes sense, right? You just need to do your part. I've already done mine. You know, everything is good. It's reasonable up to this point in the parable. And then it all goes off the rails. <clears throat> what happens to the first servant? The very first servant. At the very first harvest to collect fruit. He's beaten and sent away empty-handed. This wasn't like... <coughs> They did good for a while, and then they started getting a little, you know, a little crazy. No. This is like immediately failure, first harvest. And what, what happens to the next guy? They throw stones at him, and they wound him in the head. When you get hit in the head with a rock and get a wound, it's getting pretty serious. <laughs> right? I don't know if you've ever been hit in the head with a rock. It doesn't feel good. I we, we used to play games, and one of our games, we were throwing rocks, and I got hit in the head. And I'm like, this is a stupid game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop before it, like, you know, goes beyond this. Well, I got a goose egg. What if it hits me in the tailpool or something? It cracks my skull. Like, this is, let's play soccer or something. And so, <laughs> that's what happens to that guy. And what happens to the next guy? They're like, okay, let's not just beat him or wound him, they actually kill him. And do you see the progression and the brutality? There's an escalation every time of the violence. They're getting more bold. They're getting more brazen. They think, hey, we're getting away with this. Yeah, who cares? Let's just kill him. You know? And so <clears throat> the landowner, he sent many others. And some they beat, some they killed. And so who were these servants in the parables? The prophets. Mostly men of, notice this, of inferior rank to the hierarchy. A lot of times, the men of God would be sent who? To the kings, right? Who should have been guiding the nation. It was a theocracy. It was supposed to be under Israel. supposed to be a nation under God, ruled by God, a theocracy. You know, they only got a king because, uh, you know, God, it was a concession because of their own wickedness. They had rejected their true king. God had always, he was their true king. He always remained that. But it was a concession. We want to be like everybody else. How come they get to have kings? And we don't get to have a king. We have all these judges that boss us around and remind us about the law. We don't like this. Can we have a king? <laughs> right? And so that's what they did. But, and so, when God sends these inferior Men, you know who he was sending? He was sending people like shepherds and fig uh, gatherers. 
in farmers. That constituted some of the prophets of the old, not all of them, but some of them. And they were sent to bring Israel back to their senses, back to the purpose which God had called them to, for which they, this is what those servants of God received for their faithful service to God. They received trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Think about Jeremiah. Think of Ezekiel. You know, think of Daniel. Think of all these guys. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. We're told by church history that Isaiah was sawn in half. Um, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, right? Being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Think of John the Baptist, the last and greatest prophet, right, of the Old Testament. Render unto God what is God's. But what they choose to do instead, instead is abuse and even murder God's prophets. Last of all in the parable, what does the uh, landowner decide to do? He's like, well, they've killed all the servants and they keep ramping up the violence. You know what? The last thing, I'm going to send my beloved son, my only son. Surely they will respect him. Surely they have enough common sense to recognize and respect the son of a landowner. But the tenant farmers say among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. <clears throat> At this point in the parable, Jesus, he's going to move from a thinly veiled recounting of Israel's history. And now he's going to speak prophetically, bringing the exact indictment of what these wicked men were about to carry out in just about three days, the murder of God's beloved son. That's, about, that's what they're getting ready to do. And so, like you said, this parable is kind of like a thinly veiled retelling of the history. And now it moves to where they're at right now and about what's to come. And so Jesus, you know, he graphically puts into words the deep wickedness of the ruler's hearts. How wicked would that be to be like, oh, sweet, here comes the sun. Everybody get ready. When he gets over here, just beat him to death and we'll all split it up. That's pretty wicked, right? And so it's graphic and he puts it into words. He's saying that's how deeply wicked these Jewish rulers' hearts are. You know, and most likely, this idea of them saying, hey, like the recognition, this is God's son, let's kill him and we'll just continue, we'll, it'll be for us. That, you know, most likely, it hadn't been corporately expressed together to that degree. Like they were plotting, let's kill Jesus. But to the degree, like, hey, this is, the Son of God, this is Messiah. Let's go ahead and kill him and steal everything. It wasn't to that degree. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Jesus is looking into their heart. They didn't even know how wicked their own hearts were. And yet Jesus knew it would soon be revealed that their heart is wicked to that extent. That's how far gone these guys who were supposed to represent God to the people, you know, how far they were. And then Jesus asked the, applic the application question of the parable. He lays this whole thing out. Verse 9. Therefore, what will the owner, what do you think he's going to do? The owner of the vineyard. And that's the, right? That's the driving, that's the key question. Here's the scenario. What do you think is, you know, going to happen? Ironically, in Matthew, if you read through this, it's like they're intently, they get caught up, even though they're in this, you know, sparring with Jesus and this hostility toward him. Jesus is the master storyteller. It's as if they get caught up in listening to this story. And so, you know, when, when he says, what will the owner of the vineyard do? They immediately and they correctly respond in Matthew's gospel. 
it's recorded, they answer, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And so without hesitation, these guys recognize that the action, actions of the tenant farmers are completely inexcusable. It's like such a simple story. If you're following along, you kind of get caught up in it. You're like, yeah, that's totally inexcusable. That's ridiculous that they would do that. And unwittingly, they've just pronounced their own doom. They've just ind indicted themselves. And if you compare the Gospels, it's, it seems that Jesus, he asks the question, they answer it, he hears their answer, and then he affirms it by solemnly repeating it back to them. He's like, you're right. You know what? You are exactly right. He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And who were the others that the vineyard would be given to? It can be interpreted as to the Gentiles, but also it can be either or, but accurately interpreted to a future faithful generation of Israel. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God was being offered to Israel. In their total rejection of him, he took it back off the table. He says, no, you don't. That offer of the kingdom coming to you is off the table. It's going to be given to another, not your generation, not this generation of Israel who's basically rejected me by and large. It will be for the Gentiles. It will be to future Israel. But you're out. And so to these guys listening to this, to even suggest being the vineyard of God was a position of privilege you know, as God's chosen people, they were described as his choice as vine. That it would be taken away from Israel and given to the Gentiles to produce the justice and the righteousness he desired, it totally enraged them. Because we read the response, they totally get it. They sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, so they don't. But Jesus wasn't worried about their reaction at all. <coughs> and he further drives it home, and he refers back to Psalm 18 one more time. <laughs> Haven't you read this script, scripture? You scribes, you Pharisees, you teachers of the law, you who copy the Bible for a living and teach it, and you copy it so carefully you don't miss one stroke of the pen or you throw it away. You never read this scripture? Is this, you know, in your memory? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And they sought light to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude. For they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Interesting. Usually Jesus just spoke a parable to teach. But I mean, when Jesus speaks a parable against you to condemn you, that's pretty heavy. And so they left and they went away. And so the stone, he's the son. He's Jesus Messiah, whom the builders in Psalm 18, the builders are the same as the tenant farmers in the parable. They're the religious leaders who were listening to Jesus. There were those who rejected him, just as he predicted. But Jesus is the, he's the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you, Jewish religious leaders, you scribes, you elders, you Pharisees, and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. And whomever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You know, it's interesting, we've been going through Daniel. There was a stone that was carved out without human hands, and it was hurled, right? And it hit the base of the mountain and destroyed it, right? Jesus is the stone. You can either come to him and be broken. You can come in humility. That's the only way to approach to enter the kingdom. In brokenness, 
in humility and repentance and saying, God, I'm a sinner. I broke your laws. With a broken and contrite heart, you could come that way or you can refuse and have the stone fall upon you and crush you and grind you to powder. You got two interactions with a stone. <laughs> you can come, you know, we were talking about you could humble yourself or you can have God humble you. But you can come and you can repent and get on your knees before Him and be broke on that stone. Or you can refuse, but you will be crushed. The stone will come. Just like in this parable, what happened in the original, you know, this original illustration that Jesus is drawing from in Isaiah 5? What happened to that vineyard that God had prepared? Judgment came. This was the end of that parable in Isaiah. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. This is God speaking. Judge between me, God, and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? He's like, what excuse is there? What more could I have done? Is there a good excuse why there was not good grapes, produce, a good harvest when I came to it? What more? I mean, if God's saying, what more could I have done? Right? It's a rhetorical question. There's zero. If you or, you or I, I might be like, yeah, I could have done my homework. I could have done this better. Right? Not so with God. And now please, you know, let me tell you what I'll do with my vineyard. God's saying, if I've given you everything to be successful and yet you refuse, judgment will come. You will be held accountable for that privilege. I'll tell you what I'll do with my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the cloud, clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts, the vineyard is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. This is what God was looking for. He looked for two things in this parable. He looked for justice, but what did he find? But behold, oppression. He looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And so let's bring it home to us, uh, to the church today for application as we close. Individually and then corporately, right? It's just the same. Just like Israel the church is God's people, right? We're His people. And just like Israel, He's given us everything we need to produce good fruit for His glory and the benefit of the world. Where does that leave us? Without excuse. What excuse are we going to give to the Lord for being unfruitful, for refusing to bear fruit? for bearing bad fruit, for bearing wild fruit. Even more so than Israel. What more can God do for the church? You know why? He's even given us His Holy Spirit that He shed abroad in our hearts. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's the three you know, experiences that He's with us, He's in us, and He's upon us. And so, even more than Israel, we have the Holy Spirit to live, you know, to lead us and to live inside of us. And this is what Peter wrote in his second letter about God giving the church everything it needs to be fruitful. So he has this expectation that we will be. He says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, right? This is 2 Peter chapter 1 through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these promises we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world through lust. And so he says, okay, for this reason, you guys know it, add 
you know, give all diligence. This is what I want you to add to your faith. We come to the Lord in humility and brokenness, and we are broken on that stone. That's our faith. That's our humility coming to Him. That's the starting point. That's just the beginning. Then He says, okay, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. If these things are yours and they abound, there's a whole bunch of them. They keep increasing. You will be what? Neither barren and you will not be unfruitful. The whole idea of the knowledge of Jesus Christ is not just so that we are like become super smart. Woohoo! I memorized the Bible or whatever. I can tell you the seven spiritual laws. Blah, blah, blah. I can go on Jeopardy. The idea is that we increase in the knowledge of Christ to be fruitful. And so the bottom line is that we have no excuse, you know, for self-serving, unfruitful Christian lives. I just want to say, why, why would we suppose that we read this parable, there's a severity to it. Did you notice a little severity to the parable? Everything's coming down on this generation. They killed the Lord of glory. But look, God had sent them for hundreds and hundreds of years, centuries, this prophet and this prophet and this guy, which they, you know, continued to ignore, disobey, you know, to persecute and to even sometimes kill. And he's like, you're just like your father's. You're just like them, you know, and he removed the kingdom from them. He took the offer off the table. He said, you will not enter the kingdom of God. It will be given to another. And we know that, you know, that was the opening of the door, the floodgate opening wide for the Gentiles to come in. Doesn't mean Israel, Israelites can't be saved, Jews. We all enter through Christ, right? but the position of privilege was taken away from them. Like Rick talked about, the temple, not only was it cleansed, but it would soon be destroyed, right? They don't have a place anymore. They can't do their sacrifices. They were removed. It was taken away from them to a nation, you know, that would bear fruit. The Gentiles given up. We don't just get to say, oh, forgive me of my sins. I'm going to go to heaven and then... Just do nothing. God's like, you read the Bible, you're probably not saved. That's not real salvation. Fruit comes from those who have been saved. Why would we think that, you know, why would, if we're in that place, it's not to doubt our salvation. What it is, is it's a motivation that we have no excuse. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's in His Word, it's in fellowship, it's in His prayer. What a beautiful, I'll close with one little thought, what happened. I won't read it, I'll just tell you. It was in Matthew, and and what happened after Jesus, there's this little blurb that happens after he cleanses the temple, and you know what happens? He gets rid of all those money changers and those who bought and sold doves. It says that the blind and the lame began to come into the temple. And it said that little children came in, and they started singing, Hosanna. Glory to God, you know, to the son of David. And then the Pharisees came in and they're like, hey, shut these children up. How dare they sing these praises? It's like for this brief moment, like that's the glimpse. That's the glimpse of what these tenant farmers, what they should have been doing. They should have been caring for the marginalized, the vulnerable, you know, the people in society that we don't want to deal with. I don't want to deal with your junk. I don't want to deal with your problems. Why are you so screwed up? Those people started coming into church, so to speak, the temple, and Jesus healed them. Whoa, they had an encounter with the real and the living God. And then even little children, they went to church camp. They went to winter camp. They started singing this. They were having a VBS in the temple. Jesus was probably skipping rope, you know, and teaching them, you know, some cool games that they played in Israel. And they were worshiping God, right? That's the glimpse. And so that's what 
God is expecting out of us, He's expecting fruitfulness. You know, and we're the bottom line. We, we, none of us can say, it's like, really? What excuse do you want to give me? Don't give me your excuse. How about repent? How about turn to God? He said He'd give you everything you need for life and godliness. Look, He said He'd give you everything to make you a fruitful vineyard. He's giving you everything to make you be a fruitful Christian. Do you know He can conquer sin in your life? He's like, dude, I got a lot of divine power. I got everything you need for life and godliness. And so that's, I hope it's an encouragement and it's an exhortation. It's not to say, it's not to doubt your salvation, but it's to make your calling more sure. Doesn't the Bible say, how about produce good fruit? You don't have to worry. It's like, instead of being that far close to the cliff and falling off, how about stay way away from the cliff? You can never get blown off in a hurricane. You're so far away from the cliff and you're producing good fruit. You're doing what you're supposed to do. That's what Jesus is saying to the church. Produce good fruit. You won't have to worry. You'll be supplied a grand entrance into heaven. Be like, dude, that guy produced a lot of fruit by the power of the Holy Spirit. That guy's a fruit-making machine. All he did was hung to Jesus. You got to see the fruit that popped off that guy. Amazing. Uh, Brett, you want to come up? And we'll go ahead and close. Like I said, I hope it's an encouragement. I hope it's an exhortation. Whatever the Lord needs to do in your heart, if you need to repent, you know, maybe you're rejoicing that, man, God is producing fruit in my life. If you need to encourage someone, go to the Lord. He has everything you need for life and godliness. Holy, 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 
merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity.